It's a pleasure for me to be here today to introduce the Right to Know Hazard Communication Program at Oklahoma State University. I'm Everett Eaton. I'm the Public Safety Director at Oklahoma State University. We have three capable, very capable presenters today to talk about the program at Oklahoma State University. But first, what is Right to Know? Right to Know is a, a, is a new program that has been implemented to, to ensure that employees who are in the workplace have an opportunity to know the hazards that they might be exposed to during the course of their employment. This is accomplished through signs, labels, and placards. Labels that go on containers of hazardous substances and signs that go on the areas where substances are stored and placards that actually go on the buildings where substances are kept. Oklahoma State University's program is explained in a pamphlet that I'd like for you to have an opportunity to, to have in your possession. This is a very uh, well done pamphlet that explains the, the hazard communication standard at Oklahoma State University. However, at this time, I would like to introduce the presenters for this program. We have three very capable presenters, as I said, and in reverse order, we have Mr. Steve Bowles, who is the Hazard Communication Coordinator at Oklahoma State University. Also, Mr. Carl Mazingo, who is in the Industrial Engineering Department. And, and first presenter will be Dr. Wayne Turner. Dr. Dr. Turner is a, a professor in the School of Industrial Engineering and Management at Oklahoma State University. He is, he is a highly sought after lecturer and consultant. He has authored over 130 articles and four textbooks. Equally as important, Dr. Turner recently was the recipient of the Outstanding Faculty Award at Oklahoma State University and received the award of the Innovative Technical Award from his organization called the Institute of Industrial Engineers. Now, here's Dr. Turner. Thank you, Chief Eaton. And welcome to the rest of you, to the rest of your uh, hazard communication training program. Uh, the training program uh, is a costly program for the university, um, and I'm very proud that our university recognizes the need for the program. You will find in front of you uh, a book, and that book is entitled The Oklahoma State Hazard Communication Training Manual. If you'll pick up that book and start flipping the pages with me, we'll kind of work our way through the book. For example, on the first page, You'll notice that the hazard communication standard was enacted in April 11th of 1986, and it basically applies to all public employers uh, who use hazardous substances or to anybody that uh, produces those hazardous substances or hazardous materials. Uh, the idea behind that is we buy the materials from them, and then we have to do the training and, and uh, handling of that hazardous material so it's done in a safe manner. Uh, if you would flip on with me then. The state agency, you'll notice, is the Department of Labor, and there is the phone number there. Uh, there is a program very similar to this in all uh, industry in the country. Uh, the rest of the programs are administered through OSHA, but since OSHA specifically excludes the public employers, the state of Oklahoma has created its own standard or law, and uh, this is meeting that standard requirement. Again, it is a very expensive program, but it's very important to recognize that it is a very cost-effective program also. So the program applies to all public employers, whether they be cities, counties, uh, public schools, universities, state and local government employers, or anyone that works for a public group. Uh, as I said earlier, it also uh, covers all private employers, but they're covered through the OSHA program uh, instead of through the state-administered program. If we could kind of get on into the actual training, then if you would flip on to the next page with me. Uh, this page is probably the most important single page that you'll see. It talks about the four stages of the program. First of all is the material safety data sheet. That data sheet is the information that tells you everything you need to know about that hazardous chemical. Uh, we do not normally have to write MSDSs. We rely on the manufacturer or the uh, distributor of that material to provide the MSDS to us. However, there may be some labeling and marking that we want to do. 
the uh, manufacturer is required to label as to any hazards that might be associated with that chemical, but we might want to modify that labeling scheme because if you just think about Oklahoma State University and all of the labels that would be on campus, there would probably be somewhere in the neighborhood of three to seven or eight thousand labels. And it may be easier to just go ahead and have our own labeling system and make it easier for us to train. And that leads to the third thing there, the employee training session. The employee training session is perhaps the meat of the program in that that's our primary effort to get across that information and that material. Uh, this tape is basically serving two purposes. It is part of everyone's training, and it's also part of the training of the trainers. Some of you will be taking the information you pick up in this, uh, this course and going out and training your individual employees, perhaps at remote sites. Then finally, there is a written right to know plan, and you were provided a sheet uh, earlier, and that sheet has on it uh, Oklahoma State University Hazard Communication Standard. That is primarily the written program. There is a more comprehensive written program located here on campus, but that is the information that you would need to have. I like to remember the basic needs of a right to know program by the acronyms associated with those four steps. M for MSDS, E for employee training, L for labeling, and P for plan, or the acronym MELP. So if you can remember MELP, then you'll remember the basic uh, stages of the program. Okay, let's go on then and let's look at component one of the program or the material safety data sheet itself. This sheet is prepared by the chemical manufacturers or importers and it describes the characteristics of the product and provides information concerning the potential hazards. Uh, that last statement there is very important. It must be readily available for employee review at all times the employee is in the workplace. Let's discuss the meaning of that a little bit. Uh, the MSDS does not do us any good if we don't have access to that MSDS. So each of you will be provided access to the MSDS. If you have a new chemical or a chemical that you're working with and you want to know more about it, if you ask your supervisor for a copy of that MSDS, he or she will be glad to provide you a copy. Or if you want to just look at the MSDS, they will be more than happy to, to let you look at it. So the fact that it is readily available is one reason real key to the program. Another thing is that none of us will ever be asked to write an MSDS unless we create that chemical or the hazard associated with it itself. Uh, for example, perhaps in some experimental situation, we may be combining chemicals, a chemical reaction takes place, and we're developing a new chemical. Then that may be a different story. But in the vast majority of the cases, uh, the MSDS is readily available to you or to us as the employer, uh, and all you have to do is ask for it. What kinds of information might be on the MSDS? Well, if you look at the next page, there are certain requirements. They have to give you the company information. Who is the, uh, the manufacturer of that chemical? What is their name and address? And you'll note that they always have a 24-hour or emergency phone number on there. And the idea behind that is if a hazard uh, does develop and you need some more information, it's possible to call that 24-hour number. They also have to break it down into the hazardous ingredients. In many cases, we buy chemicals that are actually mixtures of other chemicals, and we have to know what ingredients are in it to be able to understand what hazards are associated with it. Then physical data. Uh, without getting into the, uh, the, the detail of the physical data, the vapor pressure uh, can tell us how much of a propensity that material has to evaporate and get into the air. Uh, the uh, air density of that material will tell us if it does get into the air, is it going to sink to the ground where it could asphyxiate, or is it going to float into the air? So there's all kinds of important information that you can get from the physical data, and as you get more and more into the training and more and more involved in uh, MSDSs, you'll start to understand that physical data better. Fire and explosion hazard data obviously can be quite important. In many cases, such as the one we're going to look at in a few minutes, you do have a fire hazard associated with a chemical, and that's not anything uh, particularly bad about that chemical, but it means that we have to take extra care. Uh, one of the things I like to point out to people at roughly this stage of the, the process is that the fact that you have a health rating or a fire rating 
doesn't necessarily mean that that is a particularly dangerous chemical if you use it correctly, and that's important. Take a look at some of the warning labels on some of your consumer products that you use at your home. Your drain cleaner, for example, uh, gasoline, for example, uh, some of the cleaning compounds that you might use, and you'll note that they carry significant hazards associated with them also. It's just a matter of having to use that carefully. And then the final information is the health hazard data, and that health hazard data can be vitally important to us. And let's talk uh, just a little bit about the two types of health hazards that you might have. The first is the acute health hazard, and the acute health hazard is one that hurts you right away. If you were to spill some acid on your hand, that doesn't take a while to hurt. It hurts immediately. That's an acute health hazard. That same acid, perhaps you, you breathe the vapors over a period of time, and after a prolonged exposure or after repeated exposure to that material, uh, you develop a, uh, a, a, a lung disease or some other type of target organ disease, then that's a chronic health hazard. Now, in the program, we're going to pay close attention to both the acute health hazard and the chronic health hazard. So be sure you understand the difference between those two. The acute, again, is one that hurts immediately. The chronic is one that takes time to build up repeated exposure and can hurt you over time. Other information on the MSDS is reactivity data. Uh, how reactive is that, especially to heat and water? Spill or leak procedures. What do you do if you spill a product or if there is a leak coming out of container? And uh, one thing I would ask you to be very, very careful about is if you do have a spill of a chemical product, unless you have been trained in the response to the spill of that chemical product, then you need to seek your supervisor immediately. We don't want people to go around untrained and trying to respond to spills. Special protection information. Uh, in this case, we're talking about what types of personal protection equipment you might have. Should you wear uh, safety goggles or splash goggles? Uh, should you wear gloves? Uh, should you have respirator protection, et cetera? And in many cases, chemicals, uh, the special protection information varies with the worksite. So in one worksite, we may have a lot of splashing that's possible, and we would have one set of precautionary equipment or personal protection equipment. In another situation, we would not have that splashing possible. So we have to be ready to interpret those for the individual work areas. And then finally is special precautions. Any information uh, that the manufacturer felt like they needed to put on there so that you could work, again, more safely with that chemical. If we could uh, take a look at an actual MSDS, then I think you'll find that on your next page is the MSDS for isopropyl alcohol, and it looks like that one there. This is a, uh, a good MSDS. It's a fairly simple and short MSDS, and I'm going to ask you to follow me in the page, and we'll go through the individual uh, columns there. For example, section one is the uh, material identification. Uh, the material identification gives the breakdown of what is in uh, isopropyl alcohol and what other names it's known as. Notice the CAS number there, for example. That, that CAS is chemical abstract number, and that gives the number of that chemical in case you ever need to uh, find more information on it. Also notice that in this particular case, located on the right-hand side of that first uh, row, is the labeling scheme already done for you. You'll see this block developed in a few minutes, but the first one on the left there is the health hazard data, and it has a one. The next is a flammability with a three, and the uh, last one is a reactivity with a zero. Now, we're going to see how to get those numbers in just a few minutes, but uh, many times now the manufacturers will put those numbers right there on the MSDS. It can, number one, you can use those numbers directly, or number two, you can go on and assign the numbers and then check with the manufacturer through this means to see if uh, you agree with him. Okay, the next section is on ingredients and hazards. Um, it gives there the PEL and the TLV, for example. The PEL is the permissible exposure level, and the TLV is the threshold limit value. And if you'll drop on down, uh, it gives you the uh, ACGIH, which is the American Council for Governmental and Industrial Hygienists, and that is the short-term exposure level. 
Now that's going to be very, very useful to the safety director when they go to determine what kinds of personal protection equipment or perhaps what kinds of ventilation might be needed at that work area. Again, as you go on, you'll learn to interpret these terms a bit more yourself, uh, but at this point in time, it's important that you note that a lot of information is given to us so that we can make the work area more safe. Going on to section three then, you'll see the physical data. You'll notice the boiling point is 180 degree F. The boiling point kind of gives us an idea of how likely is that material going to exist as a vapor? Is it going to boil and develop vapor? In this particular case, the boiling point is relatively high. The vapor pressure at 33 milligrams of mercury is uh, fairly high and that tells me that it's going to try to vaporize and it will exist as vapor in the air. The vapor density is 2.07, it is heavier than air so it will tend to sink to the ground. Uh, it gives you the viscosity, the solubility in water, the specific gravity. Uh, you'll notice that it is very soluble in water and that it is lighter than water, specific gravity being less than one. So therefore that material will tend to dissolve in water uh, and if any material is not dissolved it will tend to float on top of water uh, since it is lighter than one. And it goes on and gives you some other information such as melting point, percent volatiles, uh, evaporation rate, and, and molecular weight. Uh, the next section is a very important section in that it gives us the fire and explosion data. Notice the first information given there is the flash point and the method. The flash point is 53 degree F. Now that tells me that this is a particularly flammable material. What it says that is that at any temperature of 53 degree Fahrenheit or higher that any spark that develops above or in the vapors of that material will ignite. So therefore it is a particularly flammable material. If the flash point were on up above 100, then that says it's not likely going to, to flash, or not as likely anyway. Uh, notice all the way on the right hand side, it gives you the lower and upper uh, explosion limits, and basically that tells you that a concentration anywhere from 2% to 12%, it will burn. Okay, uh, it goes on down, I'm reading in the second paragraph, it says it is a dangerous fire hazard um, and when exposed to heat, flames, or oxidizers. So, we have a flammable material, that much we've learned. If you look at the next section, it talks about the reactivity then. How likely is this material going to react with other chemicals, perhaps with heat, or perhaps with water? The uh, material says, that, uh, the MSDS tells us that the material is stable in closed containers at room temperature under normal storage and handling conditions. It does not polymerize. Polymerize means it sets up a chemical reaction and perhaps develops into a gel or a solid. Uh, when it does that, sometimes it will release hazardous constituents. In this case, it does not. So I recognize here then that I have a flammable product, but it is a pretty stable product. It is likely not going to explode or create any significant uh, explosion or reactivity type problem. The next section is probably the one you'll be the most interested in, and that is the health hazard information there on the second page. And you'll need to follow me in the books because it's, it's very difficult for me to uh, put one on the screen that's big enough for you to read. You'll notice that at 400 parts per million, vapors of isopropanol, which is isopropyl alcohol, may cause mild irritation in the eyes, nose, and throat. Prolonged exposure above the TLV may cause nausea, headache, and mild narcosis. The liquid is irritating to the eyes and produces intense uh, stinging and burning. If not properly removed, isopropyl alcohol may cause eye damage. Repeated or prolonged contact with the skin may cause irritation and dermatitis. And you could go on and read that, and in fact, while I'm talking, if, why don't you? Uh, you'll note that it says ingestion will cause burning of the uh, gastronomical uh, tract, uh, and it goes on through some other information on it. So it does have a health hazard. Uh, it is all of the health hazards that I see on that page are acute health hazards, however, there are no chronic health hazards mentioned about that. And again, let me repeat one more time the distinction. The acute means it's going to hurt us right away. You put it in the eyes, you'll know right away that it hurts. 
but if you have prolonged exposure, perhaps at lower dosages, et cetera, et cetera, there is no noticeable chronic effect, or at least they, they have not mentioned it on the MSDS. So when I go to do the labeling and training on isopropyl alcohol, I'm going to warn about a uh, acute health effect and mention that there is uh, no known chronic health effect associated with it. Section 7, on the other hand, talks about spill and disposal procedures. Suppose you have a spill or a leak, how do you respond? And again, that does not mean that each of you should pick up your MSDS, read what to do, and then go respond to a spill. Uh, you will likely have somebody in your facility that is a respond, uh, response trained for spill type problems, and we urge you not to try to respond unless you have been trained. Section 8 is another one that's going to be uh, very interesting to you. On section eight, uh, the next section, it shows you the special protection information. That special protection information is what kinds of personal protection equipment you might need. Notice it says, provide general and local exhaust ventilation uh, explosion proof to avoid any ignitability problems to meet the TLV. Remember that was the threshold limit value or the ventilation requirements. Uh, if the TLV is exceeded, it goes on to say you need to use a NIOSH, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health approved respirator. So if the ventilation is such that we don't exceed the TLV, then we don't need a respirator. Uh, if indeed we are working in an emergency situation or if the ventilation does not provide us protection from the TLV, then we may need a respirator. So keep in mind uh, the difference there. Uh, going on down there, about halfway through that paragraph, you'll see that it does tell you to wear impervious gloves and safety glasses to prevent contact with the skin and eyes. If repeated or prolonged contact with liquid or mist is likely, wear protective clothing including boots, apron, and face shield or splash goggles. Remove contaminated clothing immediately and do not reuse it until it's been properly laundered. And that points out very well what I was telling you earlier. If it's set your work area and your uh, amount of exposure to this material is such that you're not going to have repeated or prolonged exposure uh, or contact with the skin, uh, then you may not want to wear gloves. You may not want to uh, wear an apron. You may not want to wear boots. If on the other hand, I were working with uh, isopropyl alcohol and uh, I was going to be using this day in and day out, eight hours a day, every day of my life, I was going to have exposed or, or contact with the skin, then I would definitely want to wear gloves and perhaps boots and an apron. And uh, one final point, when you're talking about isopropyl alcohol, keep in mind that this is rubbing alcohol. This is what is probably in each of your homes and on the bathroom shelf. And you're saying you're, you're trying to avoid skin contact with rubbing alcohol. That doesn't make sense. Keep in mind that the way you use it as a consumer at home is totally different from what we're talking about here. Uh, if I've got sore muscles, I'll go home and rub it on my muscles. Uh, that's totally different from using it and having contact with that, the skin with that material over an eight hour day every day of my life. So that's a good example of what we're talking about, judging the appropriate PPE. And then section nine is uh, special precautions and comments. And again, this is the uh, section where the manufacturer will tell you just anything that they think is important. For example, in this case, they're telling you to store in closed containers in a cool, dry, well-ventilated area away from oxidizers, heat sparks, and open flame. Protect containers from physical damage. Use only with adequate ventilation. Avoid inhalation of vapor or repeated and repeated or prolonged contact with the skin, etc. I'm not going to read through all of that. But when you get the MSDS, uh, if that is a material that you're using in your workplace, then I would suggest you read every word in that MSDS because I think uh, it's very important that you start to understand these chemicals and what hazards might be associated with them and what you need to do to protect yourself. Okay. Now, we have the information for us on the MSDS, but where do we go from there? Well, one thing we can do is to start labeling and marking the material so that we know that we're better uh, protected. Uh, for example, now, the manufacturer is required to put on each of those containers the name and address, the identity of the hazardous components, and an appropriate hazard warning. So somewhere on each of those containers, he, has, he or she has to have their name and address, the identity of the hazardous components, and the appropriate hazard warnings. 
But to be safe, we are also, as the user or the employer, we're also required to identify any hazardous components and put on an appropriate hazard warning. Well, if the manufacturer has done his job, then we really, all we have to do is to check with the uh, label and make sure that the manufacturer has done everything that they're supposed to do. But, as I said earlier, suppose that you're at a place like Oklahoma State University. You might have anywhere, and I don't know what the number would be, but probably somewhere between two and seven or 8,000 MSDSs. Uh, so that means that each, or hazardous chemicals, that means that each of us have to be able to read the labels associated with a large number of different chemicals. Instead, we could come up with our own uniform labeling scheme. It won't be different from what the manufacturer put on, but it will supplement what the manufacturer put on. And that's what we're going to do as discussed on the, uh, the next page. We're going to create, or we have created, an OSU system, and it's actually copied from the Hazardous Material Information System, the HMIS shown there on the screen. And it is a labeling system. And the idea behind it is to make it code oriented so all you will have to do is to read certain numbers you will find it is extremely easy to learn you'll get to where you know just at a glance then um, what hazards are associated with that particular chemical it does complement the manufacturer's label it does not replace or or take over from the manufacturer's label it really gives you two labels that you can take a look at when we get to the health rating, uh, we are going to use a number to talk about the acute health rating, and then an asterisk next to that number would imply that the substance also has a chronic health effect. So if you see a rating, and it might say two star or two asterisk, that tells you that the two tells you exactly what kind of health hazard is associated in the, with the chemical in an acute sense, and the star tells you that there is a chronic health hazard associated with it. To find out what chronic health hazard is associated with it, you'll need to go to the MSDS and you'll need to read the health hazard section. So the label will also tell you that whether or not it has an acute and a chronic health hazard associated with it. For example, the next page gives you the labeling scheme for isopropyl alcohol. And this is the actual label that you might see on a container or next to the container for that isopropyl alcohol. Notice that we have the name at the top. Now, in some cases, you may not use the actual chemical name. If you have a name that uh, you call it in your shop, then it's all right to put that name up there as long as the MSDS also has that name on it. You have to be able to go from this label to the MSDS. In this case, we've chosen to call it isopropyl alcohol, which as you saw in the MSDS is exactly what it, it was. We've also put the chemical abstract number on there. Uh, that's very helpful to us if we do have any sort of emergency to be able to pull the chemical abstract number off real quickly. The health rating for this, we have given it a one. You will understand very shortly what that means. The reactivity, I'm sorry, the uh, chronic health rating does not exist. So that tells you that there is no known chronic effect noted in the MSDS. The flammability is a three. As you might expect, uh, that's a higher number, so it probably has a higher flammability. And if you remember, when I looked at the flashpoint, I said, I am going to give this a higher flammability rating. And then under the reactivity section, we gave it a zero, uh, and that tells you that it's a pretty stable product. And if you remember, when we read the uh, stability or the, uh, the reactivity section, it said it was stable. And you'll note that under the personal protection equipment down there, we have put in gloves, we have put in boots, and we have put in splash goggles, okay? Now let's talk about those a minute. Uh, the gloves, if you require gloves, it has to be the appropriate type of glove. Uh, to pick an, ex an extremely ridiculous case, using isopropyl alcohol, if you went out and picked up a set of cotton gloves, that's certainly not going to help you at all. And in fact, it's going to prolong the exposure to that material. There are some materials that will react with certain types of gloves. So if the MSDS calls for a glove, it will tell you the type of glove. Be sure that you use that appropriate type. 
in this case, we, we have called for both glove, foot protection, and eye protection. And you remember I told you earlier that I could develop a scenario, a work situation dealing with isopropyl alcohol where I didn't feel any of that might be needed, perhaps in a closed reaction container uh, separated from us by some type of, of barrier so that splashing, uh, vapors, uh, any contact with the skin is totally impossible. So when we go to do the personal protection equipment, if I went over to one building here on the OSU campus and saw isopropyl alcohol, it may carry a different PPE than if I went to a building right next door where they used it in a different sense where they didn't feel like the contact was possible. So each of the PPE determinations need to be made uh, for the situation at your workplace. Now, it's going to be a little difficult since we're, we're trying to do this in a tape format for me to go back and forth, but why don't you flip to the uh, next page in your book where we talk about the health rating, and why don't you also kind of go back to the back in your book where we looked at the MSDS for isopropyl alcohol. So if we could go to the next page then. You'll see the health rating listed there, and uh, obviously it was too much to put on one screen here, but you'll notice that it has a health rating of four if it's deadly. Even the slightest exposure to the substance would be life-threatening. That's probably too much for isopropyl alcohol. Let's go on to the, the next one, which would be a three, extreme danger. Serious injury would result from exposure to this substance. Do not expose any body substance to these materials. That's probably still a little bit strong. Let's go on to the next one. Two dangerous. Uh, exposure to this substance would be hazardous to health. Protective measures are indicated. We're getting closer. Let's go to one. Slight hazard. Uh, irritation or minor injury would result from exposure to this substance. Protective measures are indicated. That sounds very close. And let's go to the final one. Uh, zero. No hazard. Exposure to this substance offers no significant risk. Obviously, uh, it is not going to be a zero. Obviously, it's not going to be a four. I don't think it's a three. Uh, I think a two is a little bit strong for isopropyl alcohol, but uh, you know, I'd have no argument if someone wanted to call that a two. We ended up calling it a one. I checked that with two references. We checked it with the MSDS, and if you remember at the front page of your MSDS in your book, it showed the little diamond and it showed a health rating of one. So we agreed with them on that. I also went to the uh, Fire Protection Association's publication on the material, and it also gave it uh, a health rating of one. So all of us agreed, so I left it as a one. And again, I didn't see anything on section six, which is the health hazard information, that told me that it had a chronic health effect associated with it, so I'm not concerned in this particular case about the chronic health effect, and I'm not going to show it. If at any time later I might decide that I think it, it does have a chronic health effect and we need to do something about that, I can always go back and add an asterisk. Or if I think that it has a chronic health effect and the manufacturer didn't call for it, I could call the manufacturer and complain about the MSDS. And some of you may get good enough to where you start doing that. There are situations where we've had that we felt an MSDS was not sufficient or it didn't contain the accurate information it should have. So, Let's assume we all agree, health rating of one. Let's go on to the next rating scheme, which would be the flammability. So if you'll flip the page with me to flammability, uh, and if you want to put your finger in the, um, the uh, isopropyl alcohol MSDS under section four, fire and explosion hazard, uh, fire and explosion data, notice that it talks about flashpoint. For a four, it's flashpoint below 73 and the boiling point below 100. Now, why would I say boiling point below 100? If the boiling point is above 100, it's likely not going to exist as a vapor uh, in ambient temperatures. If the boiling point is below 100 and the flash point is below 73, then in ambient conditions in our normal work environment, we would have an extremely flammable material. So that would have been a four. If you remember, or if you want to flip back to section four, you'll see that the flash point was 53 degree F. So it does flash or it will ignite given an ignition source at 53 degree F. However, the boiling point was given to you in the section above as 180 degree F. So therefore the four would not apply. If we look at a three though, uh, on the next rating scheme, 
uh, the flash point below 100 degree F, it is flammable, volatile, or, exposure, or explosive under almost normal temperature conditions. Here's the one that we want to use on that. The flash point is below 100, the boiling point was above, and so therefore we would come in with a three. Uh, so we've already decided to give it a three, but let me look quickly at number two for you. Uh, flash point below 200 degree F, uh, that implies above 100, but below 200. And then finally, uh, not finally, but the next one would be for one flash point above 200. And then if we could look at the final one, uh, it will not burn, substances that just don't burn. So, going back then to the rating scheme, if you want to flip to that page in your book, you'll see that we have given it a flammability of three. And I did, again, check that with the two different sources, and you'll notice that the MSDS gave it a flammability of three, and uh, when I went to the Fire Protection Association, they also had a flammability of three. Okay, so now we have a health of one, a flammability of three. The last one is the reactivity section, and let's look at the rating scheme for reactivity. Um, keep in mind that we're going to find the reactivity data under the reactivity section, which is the first page of the MSDS or section five. Uh, if I were to give it a four, it says it may detonate. Substances that are readily capable of detonation or explosion at normal temperatures and pressures. Evacuate area if exposed to heat or fire. Don't normally see a four under reactivity. If you do, it is a particularly dangerous material. Um, I'm reading, uh, to give you an idea of what we're going to look for, in section five it says, again, the material is stable in closed containers at room temperatures under normal storing and uh, handling conditions. It does not polymerize. So obviously four is, is too high. Let's go to three. Explosion, uh, explosive, pardon me, substance that readily capable of detonation or explosion by a strong initiating source such as heat, shock, or water. Monitoring from, monitor from behind explosion resistance barriers. Again, that, that's, that's too strong. Let's go on to the next one. Two is unstable. Um, violent chemical changes are possible at normal elevated temperatures and pressures. Uh, that's too strong. Let's go on to a one. Normally stable substances that may become unstable at elevated temperatures and pressures or when mixed with water. Uh, for example, any time that I have a large number of aerosol cans, I will put it as a one because it is, even though the material itself might be very stable, the fact that it exists in an aerosol can makes it unstable. Uh, again, this says in, uh, um, in the st correct storage conditions, it said that isopropyl alcohol was stable. So I think one is too strong, and we go to the last one, which is a zero stable sta uh, substance which will remain stable when exposed to heat, pressure, or water. So we ended up giving it a reactivity of zero. And again, I check with the MSDS, and I check with the, um, uh, the Fire Protection Association, and they agree and gave it a, a reactivity of zero. And then finally, under the personal protection equipment on that label, remember we went through and we talked about the fact that I have put down gloves and boots and eye protection when indeed that may be a little stronger than you would need for your given work area. Okay, uh, let me flip ahead here in my notes. If you would look at the next page in your notes, you will have a list of all the OSU personal protection symbols. Now, this list is changing dramatically. In, in fact, I think you'll find that when your uh, employer starts labeling, you will find more uh, symbols than that. But that gives you an idea of what it's going to look like. Um, and I like this scheme a great deal because what we will do is these are decals and they can be uh, obtained by contacting the OSU Hazard Communication Office here on campus. And uh, the uh, user or your boss or you will take the appropriate decal, you'll pull it off the decal sheet and you'll put it directly on the label. And it's really very little question as to what we're requiring. The one on the top left there is, is a respirator. The one right below it is gloves. The one right below that is an apron. So it's pretty self-explanatory. It tells you what to do uh, and it gets that information across in a hurry. I like it a great deal. Now, you're going, you're, you likely will have to do some rating. Some of you that uh, are not going to be supervisors may, have to, may, may not have to do any rating. You may read only what the uh, rating is. But some of you as supervisors will have to do some rating. So we've created a little problem session for you. 
In your book, you will find you have some MSDSs. Those MSDSs are for different materials. Uh, what I'd like for you to do now is to take those different materials, perhaps on a sheet of paper, uh, or perhaps on the back of one of the MSDSs, or even up on the top of the MSDS. I'd like for you to write the uh, health, the, uh, the flammability, and the reactivity, and then give me the number that's appropriate for each one of those. So go through and write down what that number number is that you think it should be for a health rating, for a flammability rating, and for a reactivity rating. And uh, don't be overcome by this. If you will just take the first material that you come to, which is methyl ethyl ketone, if you will then sit down and recognize I'm going to do the health rating, and you'll go to section five, it gives you the health hazard data. Read that, determine what number you think ought to be appropriate for that, write it down. Then go to the flammability and recognize you'll go to section four and find the flammability information. So why don't we have you go through and do that. We're gonna put a pause in the tape here. Uh, it's up to you to pause that tape, and when you're ready to go on with the training session, you may restart the tape. So we'll wait a few minutes for you to do that. Okay, welcome back. I, I hope you enjoyed that little session and, and I hope you took it seriously. It's, it's really not a difficult task, but like any new task, it, it's a little concerning at the beginning. It, 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 you uh, feel a little uncomfortable with going through it. But once you've done a few of these, I promise you they come very quickly and they come very almost automatically. Uh, and I'm not saying to do them carelessly, I'm just saying you get used to doing this very quickly. Let's talk about them in order, and you'll notice that in your book, uh, right behind the MSDSs, you do have the answer sheet. Uh, this answer sheet should read uh, something like the following. For methyl ethyl ketone, uh, I think the appropriate rating is a two for um, uh, health, uh, an asterisk, since it did have a chronic health effect associated with it, a three for flammability, and a zero for reactivity. And for the personal protection equipment, I'm just saying depends there. Uh, the, um, the reason I say that is it depends on the work condition. It depends, depends on the work environment. Now, some of you may have given MEK a one. Uh, that's also a possible answer. Uh, I've seen MEK both with a one and I've seen it with a two. For toluene, I also gave it a two star, three, zero. And if you read the MSDSs, MEK and toluene are remarkably similar. Both of them, by the way, are very, very frequently or widely used chemicals. So you probably will experience MEK or toluene at some time in your job situation. The next one is WOW, and to refresh your memory, WOW was a glass cleaner. Uh, and I put down not regulated. In a few minutes, I'm going to give you the exact reason why I say that, but I'll, I'll state it very quickly here. Anytime we have a consumer product, and listen to these words very carefully, and it's used as a consumer does, and it results in no more exposure than the normal consumer, then it is not regulated as part of the program. And that makes sense if you think about it. On the other hand, if my job was to clean glasses and I use this glass cleaner while eight hours a day on the job all the time, that's a totally different situation and the material would be regulated. I put that in there so we could discuss that point. If you have in your office or perhaps at your job site, you have materials that you're using exactly the way the consumer does. You're not using it in an industrial situation, you're using it perhaps in this case to clean glass. Perhaps like me, you have a, a desk that about once a year you might polish or clean off. Uh, so you've got something in your desk drawer that does that. Those aren't the kinds of chemicals that we're trying to cover with this program. If I were, in it, I have a wooden desk, if I, if I were working on a factory uh, assembly line and my job was to put furniture polish on this very same wooden desk, but I did it all day long, then that's a different story. That furniture polish would be included. So keep that in mind. For aluminum, I gave it a one star 
or an asterisk. Uh, it does definitely have a health effect, both a chronic and a, an acute. I gave it a one for flammability, primarily because damp aluminum dust is very flammable. Now, in my work environment, if I didn't have damp aluminum dust, then I would have given that a zero. So, you know, again, some of you probably gave it a zero, some of you probably gave it a one. And then for reactivity, uh, I gave it a one uh, because as, as discussed in the reactivity section there. Uh, also, some people in the past have given uh, aluminum a health rating of two. Uh, I think that that's a very possible answer for aluminum. Again, let's, let's kind of discuss the impact or perspective of what we just did. For those of you that might have to do the ratings, I think that workshop is very important. For those of you that your job is going to be interpret these ratings and react accordingly, I think it's still important that you understand how these ratings are done and that you understand that these ratings are very, very important information for you at the workplace. Be sure to pay close attention to those ratings. If you don't agree with the rating, you've read the MSDS and you think the rating is too low or, or perhaps even too high, then contact your supervisor. Your supervisor will be glad to discuss that with you. Uh, one of our goals in this program is to turn the employees themselves into um, more health conscious people. So I think that you will find that that's a spinoff of this program. Now. There are some things that aren't in your book that I want to discuss before I turn it over to the next person in this lecture. Um, and these are questions that come up all the time. I've got some notes here that, that I'm going to refer to periodically, so uh, kind of forgive me for looking away from the camera every once in a while. But these are questions that have come up in workshops that I've taught like these uh, all over the country, and I think it will help you understand your program a little bit better. For example, the first one, what if you're handling containers that are always sealed, okay, shipping and receiving, uh, perhaps dispensing of some sort. You handle the material, but it's in a, a sealed container. One of the problems is you may have many thousands of these that you're handling and to have uh, individual labels that you've put on it, to have individual training and to have the full stack of MSDSs, all of which may create uh, a nightmare for you. The rule on that is you are never to remove the manufacturer's label. You must leave the manufacturer's label on there. You must maintain and provide access to those MSDSs, and the training program should be what to do if there is a spill or a leak. And that's important, what to do if there's a spill or a leak. As I said earlier, and let me emphasize it again, we don't want people that are untrained in spill and leak procedures to go out and respond. If you've been trained, you know you've been trained, then that's a different story. Uh, there are certain labeling ex exemptions. Uh, for example, consumer products have already been labeled under the Consumer Protection Act, and consequently there is no additional labeling that's required under OSHA or under the Right to Know program. Total exemptions would include foods, drugs, cosmetics, alcohol, beverages, packaged for retail sales, uh, and certain pharmaceuticals, and then the consumer products that we discussed earlier and we are going to discuss again. In your office environment, there are certain products that you have that really aren't appropriate for this type of program. For example, pencils, pens, and typewriter ribbons. Even though there is a small chemical component in some of that, like the ink in your pen, they are really articles and are exempted. And primarily, any final product article whose use does not result in more than a de minimis amount of that chemical is exempted from the program. Okay, and it's left up to us to determine what the word de minimis amounts. It, it's a very small amount. For example, if I had a magic marker type pen and I was using that once a day to, I don't know, perhaps mark something on a cardboard box, then that is going to be a very small amount of that material that's emitted and I think it would destroy the effectiveness of that program to put it in there. On the other hand, suppose my job was to mark those containers with my magic markers and I had five or six of them scattered here at my work site and I'd mark the correct words on them uh, as necessary, etc. then that's a totally different story. And in that particular case, uh, I would argue that the emissions are more than a de minimis amount. 
Uh, what about vehicles, fork trucks, for example? The oil in the vehicle, the uh, carburetor cleaner, uh, perhaps in the vehicle, the additive that's uh, perhaps in the, um, the, if it's a gasoline fork truck or, an, uh, or propane fork truck, all of that material is not covered because that is now part of the truck or the vehicle. It is not the chemical, okay? Now, uh, a propane cylinder that gets removed from that, uh, that vehicle, that's a different story. In my opinion, the portable propane cylinders do need to be labeled. Do we have to cover all employees for all hazards? No. The idea behind this is what hazards are you going to experience or would you might experience if there were some type of emergency? Uh, for example, let's, let's go to the extreme cases. If I had a uh, clerical position up front in the office and back in the back I had some hazardous chemicals and that clerk never, important word, that clerk never goes back in the back, then that clerk doesn't need to be trained on those hazards. If, on the other hand, that clerk goes back uh, two or three times a day to deliver work orders, that's a different story and I think that clerk would need to be trained. I think personally it's important that all people that work for Oklahoma State University recognize the labeling scheme. And one advantage of having a uniform labeling scheme is if you do go to a different work situation, if you are asked to go over and fill in for somebody or deliver material to somebody, you'll know what that uh, warning label means. So I think all people that work for Oklahoma State University should understand the labeling scheme, but it does not mean that we have to train on the individual hazards for chemicals unless you have a likelihood of facing that chemical. The article question that I talked to you earlier is, is a very good exemption. The article and the consumer product are uh, both exemption. Both rely on the fact that you are not going to emit more than a de minimis amount. Again, uh, consumer product, glass cleaner, uh, furniture polish, any type of cleaning compound, if it's used infrequently and it's used exactly as a consumer does, that's not part of the program. But if your job is, like I said earlier, cleaning glass and you use that glass cleaner all day long, every day of your life, that's a different story and it should be part of the program. What about multiple employees on a work site? For example, perhaps you have contractors that come to your site and are working. If you have access to that work area, then you and the contractor should be exchanging MSDSs. Uh, if that contractor is bringing some hazardous chemicals to the work site to use, then uh, he or she should give you the uh, MSDSs that they're bringing. You should give them the MSDSs that you already have at your site, and then you train your own people. Uh, in many cases, we handle that by restricting access. If there's no way that you, your people will have access to that site, then um, it, it may not be necessary to do the above, but I think I would want in all cases to have the MSDSs anyway. I think that's just a good precautionary practice. Retail sales, uh, probably not too appropriate for anyone that we're talking to in the Oklahoma State uh, program, but if you are involved in retail sales, what I said about sealed containers applies. Maintain the MSDSs, train what to do on spill and leak procedures. And again, keep in mind that when we do the training, uh, and, and, and when we're trying to tell people how our program works, we're relying a great deal on our hazard category numbers. Uh, and and I, I, I love that scheme because, again, we might have five or six or 7,000 MSDSs, five or six or 7,000 different kinds of labels. Instead, we've got one label, and it's going to be there for every chemical that you might have to work with on the Oklahoma State University campus. So consequently, you can use that labeling scheme, and you can, uh, can judge the hazardous of that chemical. Uh, you may want to ask for the MSDS to get more information, but that, that, that labeling scheme relies a great deal on those hazard categories, and you owe it to yourself and really to your family, to your loved ones. You owe it to them and to yourself to find out what hazards are associated with those chemicals and to be able to read that warning label. Okay. 
we're, go we're going on now. We're going to talk about some signage requirements that we have at Oklahoma State University uh, as required to help the fire chief with his problems and also what kinds of training programs in addition to this that we might have at Oklahoma State University. So I want to introduce the next speaker to you and it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce the speaker. The speaker is uh, Carl Mazingo and uh, Carl was the project director of the design of the hazard communication program. He is not the director of the hazard communication effort here. Carl happens to also be a graduate student that's pursuing a graduate degree here at Oklahoma State University. Uh, as part of his job here, he helped pull the program together, helped the office uh, design the training programs, etc. I think you'll find Carl very knowledgeable in the area. Uh, I find it a real pleasure to work with Carl, and I think you will enjoy it also. So with that, I'll turn it over to Carl. Thank you, Dr. Turner, for that introduction. One of the neat byproducts of this program is that you're going to start noticing hazardous label signage as you go throughout uh, buildings on campus and throughout businesses in town. Uh, one such sign that you're going to start seeing on buildings on the campus and in, in the surrounding buildings in this campus area is the NFPA fire diamond or fire placard. This placard is used to convey specific information to firefighters upon entering a building to combat a fire. First of all, I'm we're, bringing, we're introducing this sign or showing it to you so that you will be able to distinguish between it and OSU's labeling system. Don't even worry about having to place these signs on buildings or do the rating. This is going to be done by uh, the OSU Safety Department or Hazard Communications Office. Basically, the numbering and the color code scheme are both are all the same as OSU's labeling system. What these signs represent, though, is a worst case uh, scenario for that building. What, the, what I mean by that is that each number in each uh, uh, category, such as health, flammability, or reactivity, okay, that's the worst case rating for that, uh, for that building. Okay, so the worst flammability in this case, in this, in this particular case for a building would be three. That means somewhere in that building, there is a material with a rating of three and enough mounts that it does, it does have to be reported. Now there could be other materials in there such with twos and ones, but the worst one's going to be a three. And the same applies to all the other categories. You're probably never going to have a uh, one particular material that will reflect the signage on the outside of a building because you could easily have, say, a two, three, four. And uh, that, that's a pretty, pretty nasty uh, material. It can come across looking pretty hazardous. But what this is is meant mainly for the firefighters and it doesn't reflect one particular material. These signs are going to be placed across campus in accordance to a policy set by OSU. Basically, all buildings on Oklahoma State University property are going to have to be placarded in compliance with the law. Each building which contains over a TPQ or threshold planning quantity of a hazardous substance will bear the appropriately numbered diamond-shaped placard approved by the National Fire Protection Association or NFPA. Basically, for uh, employees of OSU, you're going to start seeing these placards uh, appear in buildings. Okay, on the north, on north of Hall of Fame Avenue in the Special Projects area, the buildings are going to be placarded at the entrance to each area containing a hazardous substance. For the buildings on the main campus or the inner campus, containing over the, the uh, threshold planning quantity or TPQ. Okay, they're going to be placarded at the main entrance or just inside the main entrance so when a firefighter comes to fight a fire, he can r readily uh, assess the situation. Uh, I don't know, I've already started noticing these signs across campus and uh, across town too. I know when you go to, uh, to buy like pool chemicals or supplies, you, they have these signs for uh, like chlorine posted on them and you see trucks with these signs posted on them and I've even seen a few area high schools with these signs on them. All right, let's go ahead and talk about the employee training program. Basically, there are three things required. First of all, a training is going to be required at the initial assignment or hiring of the employee. For OSU, that's going to be within 30 days of the initial hiring or, or assignment. You need to train whenever a new hazard is introduced into the work area. If you get a new uh, 
material in or new chemical in or a new situation develops where you're using this chemical that's going to be in a hazardous manner, you need to retrain your employees to uh, be able to identify this new hazard and deal with it. All right, also, you need to conduct annual training too. This is a requirement of the OSU policy. There are certain training and information requirements that you need to be, be made aware of and you need to make your employees aware of or the people you're training. Employees must be informed of the requirements of the regulation. Okay, They need to be informed that they are required to be trained. MSDSs are required to be kept and made available to them and uh, basically things along that line. You need to inform your employees of any operations in their area where hazardous chemicals are going to be used that could possibly affect them. If you have, for instance, a paint booth operating in an area where there are other employees that are not actively participating in that painting operation, they still need to be made aware of the fact that that painting booth can affect them and it is in their immediate work area and you need to train them on the hazards caused by it. And this next one is extremely important. I can't stress this enough. You need to uh, Make sure your employees understand the location and the availability of the material safety data sheets and the written plan. Okay, you need to really make sure that they understand that they can get these work these material safety data sheets anytime they're going to be working. Okay, that is the requirement of the policy. The training sessions themselves must cover. First of all, you got to tell your employees how to detect the presence of a release, all right? Okay, you're going to get most of this information off the material safety data sheet. Okay, they need to understand when an exposure has occurred or when a hazardous situation does exist. You need to cover any specific physical and health hazards associated, associated with uh, the materials or situations in their work area. And then next, you need to cover any measures for personal protection, such as personal protection equipment use, uh, training for personal protection equipment, you know, fitting for personal protection equipment. That's, you need to make sure that all of that is covered in your training sessions. And also, you need to go over the details of the company plan. Sit down with them, work through OSU's written policy with them, section by section, answer their questions, and uh, be more than helpful, and be, you be prepared to answer their questions. We have given a proposed training format. It basically is the same as what we've done in this, this videotape. Okay, first of all, briefly introduce the four stages of the program, and then go into depth in each one of them. You know, cover the material safety data sheets, go over section by section, pick a few of the ones that they understand and recognize that are used in their work area. Okay, then you need to go over the marking and labeling system with them. Okay, ideally you're going to want to use some materials, the same materials you pick the material safety data sheets for. Go over the uh, labeling system with them, explain the numbers to them, explain each of the rating uh, definitions, and you know, make sure that they understand how to identify these hazards. All right, they don't have to be able to do the labeling themselves, but they do need to be able to recognize it. And uh, once again, stress that it is a uniform labeling system, and that any place they go on campus, that it's going to be the same, so that they can recognize ca uh, hazards campus-wide. All right, then you're going to want to go into the employee training program. Basically, you're just going to say that this is a required training that you, for, you, for your employees. All right, then you're going to want to go, once again, cover the written plan, go into a little bit of detail here with them, and uh, try to pick out the points and topics that you think are important for them to understand. I'm going to, later on here, we'll uh, look at the written plan, and I'll try to point out some areas that I thought were important that needed to be stressed. Then you need to describe the policies and procedures, okay, the department-specific policies and procedures. Okay, first of all, you're going to, to inform them how to, to detect the hazards, okay, and that's basically going to be, look, you know, if it's had a release, what type of release, how can we detect it, if there's been a spill, busted container, okay, whatever, okay. You're going to want to look at the material safety data sheet to determine how to approach this. All right, if there has been a spill, you're going to instruct your employees how to respond to that spill. For most of you, I have a feeling it's going to be immediately evacuate the area based on what type of hazard this thing, this material is or represents. Okay, immediately evacuate the area and call OSU's hazardous response team to come remove the material. Okay, OSU has an excellent hazardous response team and their phone number is located in the back of your training manual along with several other important emergency phone numbers that you might find useful. 
Also, the training session must cover the use of protective equipment, okay, such as PPE. You're going to have to cover how to use uh, respirators, you know, how to use goggles or if they're prop working properly. You need to get very specific here and look at the types of PPE that you are recommending and then uh, there are requirements for training for use of personal protection equipment. You need to check into that. And then we recommend giving an open book test. I'll show you an example of this test here in just a minute. Basically, we recommend giving this test to further reinforce the training that has occurred. Because it's all too easy to just walk away from a training session and uh, you know, forget immediately what you've learned. And we kind of like, there are a few things that we feel that you should be able to, the employee should retain from this training session. Moving on, there are two frequently asked questions that uh, Dr. Turner and I have had asked to us, and so we decided to address these questions in this videotape. All right, first of all, one question that a lot of supervisors or OSU employees are asking us, the people that are doing this training, is how long is this training session going to take? How much time should we devote to it? And, uh, you know, that's kind of hard to answer just right off the top. Okay, you have to get, you look at the specific department itself, okay? You need to look at the types of materials that are in that department, the types of hazards that are going to be posed in that department, and uh, then from there you can work out how long it's going to take or what you need to include in your training program. Basically, it's going to take for the basic hazard communication training covering the four steps or four components about 30 to 45 minutes. After you've covered the four basic steps, then you're going to need to look at your department specific training. For example, if you're in office, you're not going to have to get very specific in this training. We have an example in your book. Once you cover the four steps, you may have, for example, uh, some copier, copier toner for the copier, office copier machine, uh, but probably not much more than that. So it's only going to take about 30 to 40 minutes. However, if you are like a paint shop operation where you could have a large amount of paints, thinners, solvents, all right, you're going to, need to incorporate those hazards, hazardous materials into your training program. So you're going to cover the four basic components of the program, and then you're going to go into the specific training based on information you get off the material safety data sheets. All right, you're going to need to look at the personal protection equipment that's going to be, need to be used, any possible spill response regulations, and if you're having any problems, uh, understanding these MSDSs, feel free to call OSU's Hazard Communication Office and they will be more than glad to help you. Okay, that's what they're there for. Okay, for the paint shop example, it's probably going to take about an hour to hour and a half, depending on, you know, what types of needs arise. The next question we've had asked a lot of us is, is what do we train on? What types of substances do we pick out and train on? If you're like a chemical storeroom, you could have hundreds, maybe even thousands of chemicals. Okay, it's going to be very hard for you. It's impossible to train on all of those materials. So what you need to do is go through and pick out certain ones to choose on. Okay, we recommend that you choose on, you train on any material that has an OSU health rating of three or above. Or, if, or a flammability rating of three or above, or a reactivity rating of two or above. If you don't have any materials that fall into the above categories, choose four or five of the most common or the worst substances that you do have on hand and go ahead and train on them. Pull the MSDSs, pass them out, okay, show the employees uh, the labeling scheme for them, and make sure they understand uh, these, these materials. All right. Next, we have a brief a copy of uh, the recommended OSU hazard communication test. Uh, this test is very simplistic, but it does serve to get across some key points. First of all, uh, you know, the one, one I put on there is question number four. It's where are the MSDSs kept for your department? That's one piece of information that you got to be sure to get across to your employees. So you always want to include a question such as that on there, okay? because it does serve to reinforce information you've already given them. Okay, another one on there, like question number five, uh, it says if you have a question about the safe use of a chemical, always consult your blank. Well, there are several answers that would be you know, perfectly acceptable there. Consult your supervisor, consult your material safety data sheet, consult your CIL, consult the hazard communications office. As long as the employee understands that they have several options to go when they have questions about these hazardous materials, that's the point I'm trying to get across there. 
down at the bottom, uh, when, if, when you do give your test, you need to have your employees sign it and then date it. Okay, this further reinforces your documentation. All right, so if you ever get inspected or audited, you're going to be able to back up your training requirements and prove that training has occurred. Also, one more brief comment on this test. Feel free to add your own department specific questions to this test. All right, if you have any. Uh, hazards or situations that you want to be sure to get across to your employees, go ahead and add to this test. All right, adapt it for use in departments, what I'm what I mean to say. Okay. Component four is OSU's written program. Now I'm not going to go over in complete detail this entire section, but there are a few highlights that I would like to make. Okay. If you would turn in your book, it's on page 43 down at the bottom. In section 2.03, what this section basically says is there's going to be a comprehensive set of material safety data sheets kept, university-wide comprehensive set, and then each department is going to develop and maintain its own individual sets. The comprehensive set is going to be maintained and controlled by the Hazard Communication Office. So if you get a material safety data sheet that you or you cannot obtain a material safety data sheet for material and uh, you're having trouble getting the information, then you can ideally you're going to be able to call the Hazard Communication Office and they will be more than glad to help you. On the next page, page 44 of your workbook, down at the bottom once again in sections 4.01 and 4.02, this is where they talk a little bit about sealed containers. Dr. Turner briefly covered this a little bit earlier. Basically, these two, sec two sections say, do not remove any of the uh, labeling or signage that came on the containers from the manufacturer or distributor. And for anything that does not have adequate labeling, you need to fix an OSU uh, hazardous information label, okay? Then we move to section 5.01. Okay, this is an important section that you're probably going to take note of and have questions asked about. 5.01 defines what an exposure is. Basically, an exposure can be considered to have occurred any time that personal protection equipment has not been used or has, not, or has failed. The rest of section 5.01 goes ahead and covers the details of filling out an exposure report and uh, how to go about getting all that filed and sent in. Section 5.02 covers uh, the employees make, being, having to use the personal protection equipment recommended or required by their supervisors in their work area. Okay, if an employee is not using the recommended or required personal protection equipment, the supervisor def, does have the power to discipline that employee. Section 5.02 covers that. At the next section, 5.03, okay, this is the method employee can go about obtaining a material safety data sheet. Basically, an employee should be able to obtain an MSDS or be able to look at at any time they are in the workplace. OSU must provide the means for them to copy that or provide a copy to them of this MSDS within 15 days of the initial request. And you need, once again on that, you need to check with your supervisors on the location of your material safety data sheets. On page 46 in your workbook, under the topic training, we're going to look at section 6.01 and then subsection C right there. Okay, this is where it specifically says when training should occur. And once again, training should occur upon the initial hiring or within 30 days of the initial hiring of the employee annually and any time a new hazard or hazardous situation is introduced into the workplace. And then on 8.01 on the bottom of that same page, goes ahead and talks about the contractors. All right. Basically, any time a contractor comes into your work area, he must provide you with a complete set of MSDSs and a CIL, chemical in uh, inventory, of anything he's going to be bringing into your workplace. And you are required to also provide him access to your MSDSs and a CI copy of your CIL of anything that he might be coming in contact with while working in your work area. 
And that does it for me. Uh, Steve Bowles, the uh, director of the Hazard Communications Office here at OSU, will be coming back, coming back next to talk more about OSU specifics for you. Hello, I am Steve Bowles, Hazard Communications Coordinator at Oklahoma State University. In this segment, I will be covering OSU specific policies beginning on page 54 of the training manual. The first specific policy I would like to cover is the chemical information list. The chemical information list, the purpose for this is to be in compliance with SARA Title III and meet the protection of fire and emergency response personnel. The new form is much more detailed than the old form. As much information as possible is imperative. The old forms resulted in very incomplete information. Be sure to list the manufacturer when completing this form. We ask that you do not guesstimate or guess how much of a substance remains in the container. List instead the size of the container, physical state of a substance is also very important. Advise if it is a powder, liquid, solid, etc. List the chemical abstract service number and the type of container is also a new category. Please provide all information available. If the NFPA rating is not listed and you cannot rate the chemical, leave this space blank. Retain a copy of the chemical information list within your department at all times. The second specific I would like to cover is the contingency checklist. The purpose of the contingency checklist is to assist in the preparation of a campus countywide contingency plan in accordance with the Payne County Local Emergency Planning Committee. Provide all known information. If not sure, estimate the near, where the nearest fire hydrant or runoff drain is. Fill in all the information available. The most important information in the con is the contact personnel, who to contact in case of a fire or emergency in the area. If no hazardous substance are used or stored in the area, evacuation routes for other con emergency situations can be used. If no chemicals are used in the area, such as offices, some questions won't apply, enter an NA. The third specific I would like to cover is the Employee Exposure Report form. This is compliance, safety, and protection of all personnel. Have forms in your department at all times, and when completing the form, be sure to answer all questions. If in doubt about an incident, complete an EER and send it to the OSU Safety Department. Records are to be maintained by that department for an indefinite time, not less than 40 years, and the completion of this form is to protect all employees. It is not an admission of liability. The fourth and last specific I would like to cover is the self-adhesive MSDS labels. The material safety data sheet labels can be applied to any three ring binder for prominent display and accessibility of MSDS forms within the work area. You will notice in the back of the training manual are numerous forms. Among these is President Campbell's letter, HMIS labels, NFPA pocket card, brochure, material safety data sheet labels, chemical information list, contingency checklist, employee exposure report, NFPA hazard warning system, training registration list, and a hazard communications test. If you have any questions concerning what has been covered, please contact the OSU Hazard Communications Office. Thank you for your attention.